Hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Everyone's in. Good. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. All right, Zap. Make us yes. look good. Yes. So if everybody turns off their cameras, so I will look good because this has to look good. <laughs> Take it away. You hear me fine? Yep. Awesome. So hi, everybody. I'm Zap, the dumb blonde Swedish guy. And uh, I don't just do rendering stuff. I do weird music stuff, too. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to improvise something strange on my synthesizers. Because why not? So let's do that. Needs more cowbell, right? over here. Do some more of that. Some bleepy bloops. Oops. This is some old vintage technology. Gonna turn that squelchy sound down a bit. I have the technology. But now we need some. I feel like we need more of a beat in this thing. Are we ready for that? Wow, I screwed that up. <laughs> Undo button is a good button. What could possibly go wrong, they said, and everything goes wrong. That's what's happened when you're live. But now we need some sexy chords. Everything is broken so far. Let's break everything else with my bass, which I barely can play, but uh, nobody cares about those details. So let's see what we can do. Does anybody want to see more of this? Just follow me. Yeah, little shakers. Never heard anyone. Maybe even let's be cheesy as hell and do a tambourine. Because why not? interesting now let's do something else Twenty-four hours of chaos. 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 Twenty-four hours of
Nothing's gonna happen anymore. It's gonna be, yeah, I'm gonna end now. I'm gonna end. No, I'm not. Gonna... joining us on show four today. Um, so we've got some great speakers lined up for you guys. Um, and um, so my name is Nancy LaRue. So I'm an industry marketing manager for design visualization at Autodesk. So I'll be joining you as a host today, uh, along with a few other members. So what we're going to do is just kind of pass the torch and let everybody kind of introduce each other um, nominate the next person after you so that we all just get a feel and get a little quick little intro for everyone. So I'm going to pass my torch over to Bruno. All right. Thanks, Nancy. So my name is Bruno. I work with Nancy, but I work very closely with Zap. So I'm from the 3ds Max development team, and our team is actually responsible for anything related to rendering in Max, which is a, it's a big job, but it's quite fun. So I'm going to give the mic to Zap. Hello, I'm Zap. I'm down blonde and Swedish. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Who's next? You pick, man. Just like in the morning scrum. Uh, but Nancy already went, and I can't see anybody. Terry. Terry. Hello. Thank you, Zap. Uh, my name is Terry Sin. I'm managing director at Normley. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, Archviz firms in Canada, and we're based in Toronto. Uh, and I think we'll do a bit more of an introduction uh later uh but let's bring it over to jeff hi jeff hey there thank you uh yeah i'm jeff i'm the founder of cg architect the largest online community and kind of online magazine for architectural visualization professionals and been doing this for i guess 19 years a couple weeks ago and i will pass this off let's see who hasn't gone yet uh, antoine Oh, you You're on mute, mute Antoine. Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> oops, I'm back. So hi, I'm Antoine. Uh, I'm in Montreal. Uh, I'm the founder of a uh, game studio de de dedicated to 3D arts. And uh, I would like to add to Bruno that there is a big, best bagel in Montreal, but there is also the best poutine. Don't forget it. It's true. It's true. So uh, <laughs> now I will pass the following to Samia. Hey, hey, I'm Samiha. I'm Samiha Defewi. I'm an interior designer and 3D visualizer. I'm a Tunisian based in Qatar. So um, actually, I'm working as a freelancer and I'm really happy to be among you tonight. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. And who's next? So, Daniela, you want to go? 
Hey, how are you guys? So I'm Daniela Bringas, I'm from Mexico. I, I'm so happy to be here, to be honest. So this is my first presentation. I'm so excited to see full presentations here. So I'll let you know later who I am, but <laughs> um, I'm gonna bring to Jeremy. Hi, uh, I'm a 3D, uh, senior 3D artist at Artifex Animation Studio. Uh, we specialize in uh, 3D animation and VFX for uh, film and TV. Uh, this is also my first presentation and I'm really uh, excited to be here too. Uh, I will pass it to Laurent. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Laurent. I'm uh, running the Montreal user group for more than a decade now uh, for 3DS Mac users. I've been involved in the 3ds Max community. I'm the founder of Diomatic, uh, the plugin company, and I'm also the producer of K6 Media Group. Um, so I'm running this company. Today I will be presenting one of our latest production. Excited to be here. Very happy, everybody, to, to be here with everybody around the world. That's very exciting. Yes, yes. So that's it. Everybody went. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you, everyone. So now if we can put up the schedule for the, the next 45 minutes. There you go. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> All right. So, introduction okay. done. No, we're going to start. So <laughs> let's jump. So our first speaker today will be Terry. So as you mentioned, Terry is the, you mentioned he's the managing director at Norm Lee currently the largest architectural visualization firm in Canada. So as a member of the ArchVis community, Terry, Terry focuses on training of artists entering the industry. And he has been a lecturer at the University of Waterloo, University of Toronto, Ryerson University, and he serves on the Professional Advisory Council for Architecture at the Sheridan College. That's right. That's Correct. quite a quite an achievement. <laughs> so, are you based in Toronto? Yes, we are. Yeah, downtown. Well, fun fact: It's about six-hour drive from my place. So we might think that Toronto, Montreal, is no. <laughs> well, All right. if we go three hours each way, we can meet in the middle. It's true. We can meet. In the middle. <laughs> All right. So I'll let the. I'll pass the mic and also the presentation to guys. If I can just do right. a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Yeah. Um, so don't forget that everybody who's watching the event right now has the chance to win some great prizes. True. Um, so we're offering prizes from V-Ray, Corona, Sinai Software, and Creative Lighting Group, also as, uh, well, 3DS Max. So you have a chance to win an annual license from a few of these people. And also, if you want to register for this raffle, just go to the Chaos Group uh, 24 Hours of Chaos uh, landing page website. So that's where you enter. And then uh, there's also take a selfie with uh, your pets, your plants, your pillow, watching the event, hashtag 24 hours of chaos. And uh, you have a chance to win a few more prizes. And well, let's be honest, everybody likes to get mail these days. So you can be surprised what you can win if you do that. So make sure to enter. Yay. Over to you. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna see if there's if this all works out. Hopefully, it all does. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen right now. And so we'll transition this. over to Terry. Yeah. All right. So once again, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, this is a, a an amazing event. Um, and for my talk, uh, it might be a little different from some of the other presentations. I, I'm not really going to talk about rendering per se, but what uh, rendering and visualization can do for communities. Um, so just as a start, uh, a little bit about me. This is my dog Pringle. Uh, so wait, do I already get like the hashtag like prize already for, for having a dog? Um, so I am a managing director at Norm Lee. Uh, I deal with hiring and training. Uh, I have a, a master's and bachelor's degree of architecture from Waterloo, and I went to the State of Art Academy uh, Master Class 16. And I am V-Ray certified professional and a licensed trainer as well. Um, in terms of our company, we are based in Toronto. Um, we do everything from uh, real estate, architecture, 
Uh, we do uh, VR, AR, animations, uh, of course, still renderings, and quite a bit of photography as well. Uh, but again, uh, not really the focus of my talk today. Uh, what I want to talk about was how our industries, so uh, from Archviz all the way to VFX and things like that, uh, have the power to do good for others. Um, we had the unique opportunity to work on a project for the United Way um, called the Unignorable Tower. And I, I guess before I begin with all of this, I also understand as a large company, we are privileged to be able to work in this industry. And uh, the, the kind of purpose of this presentation is to recognize that and find ways that we can use that uh, to help others. So uh, in Toronto, I mean, most people kind of view it as, you know, from other countries, a very beautiful city it is. Um, you know, it's prosperous and thriving. However, at the same time, uh, the greater Toronto area, so downtown Toronto and a few other uh, cities around are called the, the greater Toronto area is actually the poverty capital of Canada with uh, one in seven residents currently struggling. Um, so we had the unique opportunity to work with uh, Taxi Agency, which is an amazing uh, creative agency here in Toronto as well. Um, and the United Way to visualize a tower. And it illustrates how much we would need to do to house the uh, 116,000 individuals that are currently affected by uh, poverty and uh, issues with affordability. And if this tower existed in real life, it would be the world's tallest building. Um, so we only served as the kind of rendering uh, portion of this campaign. There were a lot of other people involved. Um, with the United Way, we, there was um, uh, Alter Ego, Array of Stars, Berkeley, Brookfield Place, the City of Toronto, Fair Maid, KPMB Architects, Lossless Creative, our team, uh, Saints Editorial, and Taxi. And everybody played a role in uh, video editing. Uh, there's an AR portion um, even Brookfield Place rented out um, their, their buildings to allow for an exhibit to happen. So all of these members uh, also did all of the work for this project pro bono. So nothing was uh, billed, nothing was invoiced, everything was done for free for the United Way of Greater Toronto. Um, so I'm gonna play a quick video. Um, hopefully, I'm just gonna change the settings quickly here and make sure it's optimized for sharing. And let me know if this goes up. Toronto rent prices have hit a new high. Every level of the housing continuum in our city is in a state of emergency. Almost 9,000 people are currently homeless. People are just desperate to find a place that they can afford.
So um, that that video was, of course, um, a collaboration uh, between all the companies that you saw on that previous slide. Uh, we provided the still imagery and some of the assets for the AR. Um, Array of Stars did the AR portion of it, and Taxi and all of their uh, the various production companies dealt with the video and editing. Um, so these images were created uh, using aerial photography, both by our team as well as taxis. And the whole idea was to be able to represent this uh, problem uh, in, in our city. And uh, I mean, on a technical side, this was done in V-Ray and 3ds Max um, and, and Photoshop to put it all together. So just a couple more images. Uh, the, the, the tower itself would be 2.5 times the, the height of the CN Tower. Um, there was even uh, signs around the city uh, that were made to look like uh, construction notices for uh, Toronto uh, to show the issue and kind of get people's attention on, on the whole entire uh, problem that we're facing. Uh, there was a full uh, special section of our local newspaper, the Toronto Star, which included all the data points and the imagery, as well as various articles uh, about the issue. The AR app was um, uh, particularly engaging for a lot of people. It used the, um, the CN Tower as almost like the QR, the QR code to line up. And um, the app itself uh, provided information about the United Way and as well as a direct button to donate. There was also a uh, in-person kind of physical exhibition uh, about the project um in bc place or sorry brookfield place uh that generously allowed uh taxi and the united way to uh inhabit the space uh our renderings were posted in in full to engage the community uh it was an interesting thing being there on the first night uh, a lot of people were coming up and thinking that this was a real project because in toronto there are so many condos going up we actually had people coming up and asking how much did a penthouse cost or uh, you know, when, when is it going to be completed for, for construction? Uh, but at least in that case, people were being confronted with an issue that is completely out of their, their reach. And the model itself was actually donated by the city of Toronto that they usually use for their own purposes. So all of these different teams came together to use all of their creativity and their resources for a greater issue and doing it out of their, the goodness of their hearts to, to provide insight into this issue. Um, so that, that's one kind of case study of the, the power of using creativity and all of uh, our, our resources and, and talents to move towards something that is kind of more for the good of the community rather than kind of uh, making money or, or for individuals themselves. Um, so I also want to talk about how visualizations, aside from the ones that I just showed, can also start to spark conversation, um, especially right now in the political uh, climate right now. There's a lot of things that are being brought up to the surface that are extremely important. And like all art, rendering and visualization can play a part in that. Uh, Fabio uh, Pavelli, which I'm sure everybody knows about, uh, who's watching right now, and I'm sure he's probably watching right now as well, um, co-founder of D2 Conferences. Uh, he has a prolific YouTube channel. Um, so during the pandemic, he created a series of challenges uh, while everybody was at home to engage people, to make sure the community was still active. Uh, when we couldn't go to conferences or, or meet in, in person. And one of the interesting ones that came up, so all of the, most of the challenges were kind of about subject matter uh, that we're kind of used to, to working with. Um, but number 10 that he did was Together We Stand. As uh, riots started happening or, or protests, peaceful protests happened in, in the States and all over the world for that matter, 
uh, he decided to make a subject matter about the issues that were happening. Uh, and from there, beautiful art came about. Uh, this is by uh, Dorca from San Francisco. Um, by the way, there's also, if you watch the YouTube video about this, there's tons of images that were created from all over the world, kind of representing the, the fears, the, the anger that's happening right now, as well as images of hope for tomorrow. Um, the interesting thing was that usually these challenges throughout the time were kind of competitions, friendly competitions uh, between artists. But for this one, because of the, the subject matter, uh, Fabio started a conversation instead uh, on his channel. And I, I really recommend you to watch the full, uh, almost three hours that they spoke about the art. Um, and it really kind of brought up, uh, we, there, was, there was pretty divisive conversation that happened during the conversations and of course in the chat. So I just wanted to highlight the ability of visualization to start conversations and hopefully lead to uh, greater solutions. Um, there's also opportunities for companies like ours to uh, do community outreach and providing opportunities uh, for those who might not be able to, or, or don't really think about coming into any visualization industries. Uh, you know, we're very lucky to be able to do things that we love, but there's a lot of people that aren't able to do that. And I think it's up to uh, companies and, and people to provide those opportunities for people. Um, so in Toronto, there's, there's two great, uh, organizations that I want to talk about. The first is the remix project. Um, and it, it, its purpose is to serve these underserved communities and provide, um, alternative educational programs and facilities for, for people who might not be able to get into the industry for, uh, there's been huge success stories about the remix project in terms of the music industry and television industry. And I think there's a lot of opportunities within visualization, whether or not be VFX to ArchViz to uh, hire from these type of programs. Uh, we in fact have hired our, our new uh, motion graphics designer from the Remix project. And the purposes are to decrease youth violence, strengthen mental health and increase 21st century employment skills. Sketch is another uh, uh, um, organization in Toronto um, that provides, uh, again, uh, experience uh, in the arts to kind of build the future artists that will kind of um, provoke change in, in communities. Uh, their model is the theory of change to create art, to develop artistic practice, to lead in art activism and enterprise, and in the end, create radical art to uh, transform lives and communities. So um, we, we know quite a few companies who have uh, hired from Sketch, uh, photographers, graphic artists. So there's a lot of opportunities, uh, and I know that this is uh, being broadcast around the world. I uh, implore companies to start looking outside of the box from the normal kind of uh, streams that we look for hiring and look at organizations like this locally within your cities um, to give people opportunity. Also, as a larger company, we work with a lot of different clients. Uh, we're also friends with other people in our industry. So we have a large network. And while that network is usually used to find more clients, or find the next job, uh, we can use that same energy to network and basically help the community. What we did, or, or, or quite a few different companies banded together to create U Reunited in Toronto, which was real estate, architecture, and design companies coming together. Uh, it all started really during the pandemic uh, to at least start to connect again with our peers. Um, but what it turned into was uh, an event that we did um, called Games for Good. 36 teams uh, competing in just kind of all types of games, Pictionary, Trivia, um, 
and each team uh, raised money for the charity of, of their choice. Uh, we had 30 plus sponsors that donated almost $20,000 and uh, by the end of it, nine charities received funds ranging from 500 to uh, almost 7K. Uh, here's just kind of a snapshot of some of the charities that, uh, that benefited from this and the, uh, the teams that, that helped make that happen. And everybody had a great time. We were able to connect together with uh, our friends, uh, our clients, our peers, all for something good. And um, I think now is a great time for the community to reach out to all of their connections and see ways that we can help others while others are in need. Uh, I guess the kind of conclusion to this is that creative industries can leverage their skills, resources, and connections to do good for the world. Um, this weekend, or actually Norm is doing a, uh, it, helping with a live stream. So during the pandemic, because sales centers couldn't exist, we've started to do live streaming of sales. Um, so instead of selling a condo right now, we're going to use all the skills that we've learned over time to do live streaming, to live stream a DJ uh, kind of party uh, that will benefit the, uh, the Remix project uh, Sketch Toronto and uh, Vive Arts um, to hopefully uh, raise some funds. Uh, if you are interested in joining in, follow the link uh, normally.global, all, uh, all vinyl, everything, and you can donate directly to the charities uh, from there. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks for watching and I uh, look forward to talking to all of you afterwards. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That's it. Wow, thank you so much, Terry. I have a lot of respect to you and your team for paying attention to what's happening and for, you know, providing just support for the rest of the community. So that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's really inspiring. And seeing our yeah. being used, you know, to raise your initiate reflection and it's, uh, yeah, it's truly great. And seeing like the Wings Gracie exhibition next to the Tim Horton, it cannot be more Canadian than that. It's beautiful. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, guys. So we're going to move on to the next speaker. So next up, we have Daniela. So um, I actually came across da Daniela's work in the uh, Women in Arch Biz. Facebook group, which is a group dedicating to empowering and supporting women in the industry um, and helping them support each other and kind of bringing a voice to their art um, and to their passion. Um, so I really loved her work and I reached out to her. And um, so Danielle is located in Boston and she's part of the Neoscape 3D team. And ever since she was a child, her passion was 3D video games. And now she's super excited that she gets to create her own 3D world um, and brings that passion into her work. So over to you, Daniela. Hello, guys. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. So, hello, my name is Daniela Bringas, and I'm really excited to be here. And first, I would like to thank Autodesk and Chaos Group, Nancy. <laughs> I'm really excited. So first, I would like to start with this quote. Creativity is inventing, experimenting, growing, taking risks, breaking rules, making mistakes, and having fun by Marilu Cook. I really love this quote because I can see my work uh, habits every day with this. So when I found it, I was like, hmm, I love it. <laughs> so a few words about me. Uh, I'm from Mexico. I'm an architect and I'm a CG artist. Yes, this mini represents me a lot every day. Um, so in 2015, I started to do my renderings, uh, but weren't so pretty. So I started to study a lot and work very hard. I hope nobody gets offended with this mini because I really love it. I would like to find this guy and that he can teach me how to do it. <laughs> so in, th in 2018, I started to do better rendering. So 
I, I got hired at Neoscape. So this is me creating very cool and very complex projects. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a five, very young five years old CG artist. So I'm going to show you right now a video that you can see some of my works that I have done in the past five years. Are uh, not a lot, but I really enjoy to do it. I hope I hope you can see it. Um, this music <laughs> but I love it anyway so here are some of my favorite projects that I have done um, I really learned a lot to do it when I was doing it uh, and I don't know it, it is a passion to me to do 3d every day at work at home so I'm going to show you a little bit of the workflow that I use when I'm at home. Um, in the office, we use other type of, of workflow, but here I'm gonna show you how I can do this type of renderings. It's not every day because sometimes I have deadlines, but my first step is inspiration. So you recently started to do meditation really helps me a lot and I discovered how to be more creative uh, with these me with these meditations I don't know how but helps me a lot I also like a lot to, to use books uh, even if it's like five minutes uh, one page anything everything helps I got inspired with these uh, some of these books that I'm going to show you that is this one uh, the illustrated man, that one guy that works in VFX, uh, told me, Daniela, you should read this book. And this one, that is one of my favorites. Also, I used to watch, well, I love to watch movies and TV shows, for example, with good cinematography. This helped me to be very inspired, like Game of Thrones, Batman, <laughs> and Zombies. Uh, this is a World War C. I really love these movies. Even a fun fact is is when I, when I was learning to do matte painting, I used to create all my, my, my works with dragons and everything because I was watching Game of Thrones in this moment. I also love uh, the cinematography of Emmanuel Lubezki. I do a lot of my researches of, uh, of him, uh, Alfonso Cuaron and Guillermo del Toro. It helps a lot. Um, also photography is very important for me when I go to the, to the city and take some pictures, even it helped me in my work because sometimes Neoscape can tell me, Daniela, we need to go and shoot a helicopter shooting and we need uh, to go to other place to take pictures and everything helps me to create a new compositions in, in all my works. Music. Music is very important for me. I can imagine a lot of things with music and uh, new stories, everything. And also tequila and mezcal helps, uh, <laughs> helps a lot to find good ideas. Um, so what to do? That is the main question that everybody has when uh, you are doing a work. Um, you really, the, I, I really use these um, inspiration methods to find a good ideas. I really love it. Um, after I find my idea, my ideas, I start sketching. Sketching, even if, uh, if are horrible your sketches, it doesn't matter. It, it's gonna change during the process. 
you can see here, my first draw was horrible. <laughs> but I was meditating and then, boom, this image came to my mind and then I did uh, the, rend the final render. And references. This helps me a lot to find uh, geometry, uh, how I would like my, my lighting, how my shaders, mood, everything that I need. For example, this vending machine, I use it as a reference uh, for my aliens uh, rendering. So everything helps. Even if it's like uh, you were walking and you shoot uh, this street helps. It doesn't matter, believe me. So this, this step is very essential for me because I, will, I, I can organize my time. As you know, I'm, an, I'm not a freelance. I usually work in, in a company that is uh, deadlines every week, every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. So I have a very tight schedule. So I, I can see like, okay, I have one week to do it. I have to do three weeks, uh, one month. One century, maybe not. <laughs> so if I have one week, I should know which software I, sh I have to use, uh, uh, new plugins, uh, assets, everything in, for example, assets that, okay, I have to buy textures. I have to buy uh, anything that I need to create my ideas on my renderings better. I do it in this step. I usually use 3ds Max, V-Ray, Photoshop, Corona and Substance Painter to create my images. Uh, the f and, and then I start modeling. So as you can see here, that I don't know why it's not showing. Ah, here it is. Modeling. So as you can see here, I create a very basic uh, models at the beginning. I don't like to create like, okay, very hard poly, high poly, because this can change in one moment. And I don't have time to do it like, okay, I cannot spend like um, a long time because I can't forget about it as usually a lot, a lot of artists uh, <laughs> deal with it. So this can change. This, this say start with basic shapes and, and if I like it, then I start adding more details. So basic geometry at the beginning. And then this is the essential, the devil is in the details. Because if you add details, everything looks amazing. So you have to keep it an eye. <laughs> Texturing also. I use V-Ray for do my textures. I like the lot to customize my textures. I don't, if I gonna buy a new texture, I don't like to use it like, okay, I bought it and use it. No, I love how, how to customize my textures to do it better, to don't have everything, other assets that other artists has already. So I love to do this. And re recently I started to use Substance Painter. Uh, Substance Painter helped me to do my props faster. Is, it is a little bit uh, complex program, but I really love it. I'm loving it a lot. Uh, and it works but It works very hard, good, but both I, I like it, V-Ray and uh, Substance. So my lighting, this is my favorite steps of all of the past. Uh, my lighting, I love paint with light, all my images. As, as you can see, at Neoscape, we have most of the time one time of, um, of of light because of clients. But here I can be more. I can have more freedom. I can use environment fog. I can use colors. I can use uh, shadows. Something more dramatic that helps me. Like okay, I want to put everything. Like I cannot use at work. So this. It makes me very inspired when I was I'm doing my lighting. I also use references for my lighting. As you can see here, I cannot start any lighting without any references because I can get lost. I can spend hours. I can spend days. Like okay, I don't know. I don't have idea which type of lighting. So references help me a lot how to do 
good lighting. And recently I started to use this method that is uh, with images, the, the color of my lighting. I can create very beautiful sunny days, romantic uh, nights or something more creepy. So this, thank you Santi for teaching me this, this amazing method. And then after millions of test renderings, I send to render. This is a feature that I have that I love to do test render for everything and I can spend more time, but I really like to do it as well. I cannot change it. And then after everything, post-production. So I'm a person that usually do everything in 3D. I love uh, generate all my details in 3D. And if I need to paint something, I do it in Photoshop. Like for example, in the left image, I put myself there and Blanca, she's my dog. And I usually put more effort in 3D. And if I, I need to use uh, Photoshop, I use it to create more life to my images, some levels, curves, color correction, something that my image can, can have like more, I don't know, pop, powerful. And these images I created in Corona. I love Corona because you can create uh, final images in, in your frame buffer. I know V Ray 5, you can do the same, but in Corona, I like it. So I'm not married with one software, to be honest. I can use any. And then the end, happy renderings. <laughs> so I love the result of these images. I really enjoy it. I learn a lot. I can use any software. I can. I would. I love to to use. Uh, I don't know. I learn. I'm learning Unreal. I would like to learn uh, others. So it doesn't matter. So here I would like to show you one project that I was working for one and a half year more or less. So Carlos, uh, the director of, the, of Neoscape, allowed me to share with you this work that has been very important for me because uh, I create a, a lot of things. So this is a very important uh, project. Uh, it's an observatory deck. It's the biggest observatory deck in New York City. So it is it was it is an animation that we created for the elevator it's an experience everything was developed in 3d a lot of people work on this project but my main task was create lighting to paint lighting in old manhattan one day jerry arrived uh, jerry is my manager he, he arrives and he told me like, oh, Daniela, you like to do lighting. And I was like, yes, I love it. And he told me, okay, you will do Manhattan. <laughs> and then I, I really like to do it because I learned was very challenging. Create, I created uh, lighting for Highline, lighting for uh, Times Square, animated lighting, animated lighting for Empire State, for a concert, all the interiors I did it um, was very challenging, but I really love it. Other people created uh, all the geometry, but uh, shaders and everything. A lot of people work on this project, but my main task that I really love was lighting and the details, a lot of details, like, okay, like these shops and everything. So everything that I learned doing my, my, my personal projects, I use it here. So I do recommend you can find any chance to create uh, a, a fine time to create your own personal project because you can learn a lot. And then if you, can, if you need to do something uh, very complex, you can create it. You don't have, you don't, you, you're not gonna struggle like, okay, maybe I don't, I cannot do it. So you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Daniela. I, <laughs> You're welcome. I hope you like it. Wow. Zombie, alien butt crack, and Archbiz. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it cannot be better than that.
<laughs> yes. So I wanted to do something funny, something interesting, aliens, something <laughs> about what I love to do every day. Yeah, maybe well, next Fabio there. challenge, right? Next yeah. Fabio challenge could be like zombie in Archviz. That would be awesome. I would love. <laughs> You're going to win this one. Awesome All right. job, girl. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so is that sleeping? We were wondering if he's sleeping. <laughs> I know it's late. Okay, I won't wake him up. It's fine. All right, so our next speaker. Next up is Jeremy Berger from Montreal, one of our homeboy from Montreal. So Jeremy started his career as a 3D animator in video games and quickly found that he wanted to learn more about 3D and evolve in the world of 3D. Uh, he's now a senior 3D artist in films for Artifacts Animation Studios. And my kids are about to go to sleep and they finally believe that I'm a real YouTuber because I'm on YouTube. So good night, boys. It's, uh, it's getting late, almost nine. They have school tomorrow. All right, Jeremy, take it All away. right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruno. And uh, also a very nice background you got there for Zoom. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, my, it's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really funny. Uh, so for my presentation, it's going to be about a project that we worked uh, here at uh, Artifacts Animation Studio. Um, uh, it was a really nice project. It was called uh, Nadia Butterfly. It's uh, an actual uh, Quebec production. So we're, we're very proud. And uh, it was actually selected in the official selection for Festival de Cannes 2020. Uh, so in a short moment, I'm gonna present to you uh, some of the shots uh, that we did. It was actually for the crowd part of the project, it was two uh, sequence shots. So it was some really long shots. And for the purpose of that demonstration, I'm gonna just show some, uh, some of the parts. Uh, we were a team of two on the 3D side of things, so we were quite small in that uh, in that side of the project. And uh, we also, you're going to see that there's a screen in the background. We also added a big screen to show uh, like the race itself. The the film is about uh, uh, a Quebec, uh, Canada Canada team going to the Olympics in uh, Tokyo. So it's fictive, but it's like there's going to be Olympics soon. So. Uh, I'm going to show that and then I'm going to show you guys uh, how uh, how we did it. It's going to be more of a maybe a technical presentation. I'm going to do a live uh, live demonstration of my uh, my tie flow that I use for the making of that uh, that project. Awesome. I'm going to share my screen with the optimize share. All right. So here we go. So yay, Canada won. Um, so all right. So I said we were a team of two, and we had uh, two months to do the whole uh, the whole project. So uh, first things first, I was uh, tasked to do the characters, the uh, animation for them, and the actual crowd simulation. And uh, my coworker was doing all of the set extension. As you could uh, could see, it was a three D set in uh, in the background with the crowd on top. So uh, two months for us uh, in the artifacts, we, uh, we didn't do a lot of full 3D crowd. So it was a first for us. We, we learned a lot in the, in the process. Uh, so when I first started the project, I needed some characters. And as uh, anybody that has a limited amount of time, uh, you can just literally buy them online. So that's what we did. We bought uh, 12 characters, six male, six female that were already rigged with a biped. And for the animation, we found a nice little pack of animation for crowd. 
it wasn't that easy though. Uh, of course, we needed to fine tune some of the details. So like the characters were sitting uh, a bit too high compared to our stadium uh, seats. So a bit of fine fine tune there, but it was it was a good start. So so we had characters and everything in the beginning was nice. Uh, with the animation and the characters themselves, just straight up with the animation we bought online, it was something looking like this. So it worked perfectly in our case because it was like you saw in the video, pretty much in the background. So uh, it was perfect for us. For the next step, I'm going to show you how I did the actual crowd simulation. So for uh, for all of you that uh, don't know uh, what Typhlo is, uh, I'm pretty sure you all know. But for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, it's a free particle uh, plugin for 3ds Max. It was made by the uh, talented Tyson Ibel. Uh, he updates it really, really, uh, really uh, regularly, and it's uh, it's an awesome little program. That since it's free, it's amazing. Just for those of you that didn't that didn't use it yet, uh, I definitely recommend you to uh, to try it. So uh, on the more technical side of things, uh, here's my 3ds Max scene. I'm going to maybe just uh, disable for now the optimize so that I have less lag. Well, it's going to lag, but it's going to appear more crisp for you guys. Uh, so the way it works. So first off, uh, all of my characters here, uh, the 12 ones uh, with their variations, could, because all of the characters have three different texture variations to add more life in the whole crowd uh, are here and all of them with type flow the way it works is you have to uh, to put them into tie actors for all of them this is how uh, the simulation is going to take them and and show them on screen so um after my coworker finished up the uh 3d part of the of the uh where is it sorry um, stadium. All right. Okay. So this was the 3D uh, model that my, my friend did. And as you can see, there's uh, all of these little green points. They're actually uh, point helpers in 3ds Max. And they're positioned right in front of all of the seats. There is about 5,000 seats in that current uh, stadium. And the points are needed to spawn all of the characters in the simulation afterward. So if I zoom in for this presentation, I'm going to just focus on one section because uh, otherwise it would take a while. Uh, here I can activate my character. So it's going to be a section like this, which is uh, about 80 seats. So as you can see, uh, they are uh, casual people. We call them casual that because they're not associated with a team. And Team Canada and Team UK in the back as an example. So if I open really quickly my, uh, actually I have it here, Typhlow. Uh, Typhlow is a nodal uh, particle system. So uh, it's really, really user friendly. And uh, the thing you see on screen, I'm just gonna stop moving because it's gonna lag for you guys, uh, is the whole tree, the, no the whole node tree that is uh, doing the simulation. So that one is for the casual people in the middle and there is one for each single team. So we uh, specified some points in the stadium where we wanted the teams so that we had more control on where, where uh, we add them. So if I zoom in real quick, First uh, first stage is the start one. So the way it works is since it's a particle system, you uh, spawn your particle first. In that case, 56, because it, it, this is the exact number of points that we, we chose. And then you position them on the helpers themselves. So here you get all your, your helpers that you selected. Uh, final step in the first stage is a split where we remove about 20% in that case uh, characters. So that makes it more uh, human more lively so uh, that not all of the seats are occupied. We then take all of this, send it out, and then we have this big step, which is going to filter out all of the, the, the particle and assign them to one of our 12 characters. So we got, like I said in the beginning, uh, six uh, female, uh, six male. And the way we did it, because in the first place, uh, in the first time we tried that, uh, since we didn't have a lot of characters, 12 is not that much for 5,000 seats, uh, we often ran into a problem where two characters uh, identical were sitting next, right next to each 
here. So you can imagine that it's a bit weird when you uh, when you see a crowd and like, oh, there's two uh, twins, uh, like exactly the same. So the way we uh, counter that was to have every X number of particle to change uh, the character. So that way we never add uh, the same character side by side. So once we did that, uh, all of these little uh, characters are sent out to their own state. So for example, I'm gonna take that one, which is, uh, mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna take that one. So male one, for example, goes here. And then it's like a two part uh, step. So you got the first one here, which spawns the actor, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, where all of my actors were predefined and it uh, shows up the, the mesh of the character. So it takes the, it takes the rig, it takes the animation, and this is where it gets added to the scene. So uh, that's for that. And then uh, material ID is a random ID between the three, uh, the three uh, textures for each of the characters. So this is the part where we randomize the color of the, uh, of the assets. Um, at some point in the production, the, um, the client wanted us to add some flags so that the uh, crowd was going to wave some flags during the animation. So this is where that second part comes in. Uh, there's a, there is a 30% chance that uh, the actor itself is going to go in that state instead and spawn with a flag. So uh, this is how we managed it. Uh, if I go down, all of these are then, uh, sh uh, they are then going out to the final step, which is the animation step. So in that uh, node right here and this one, uh, there is a node called actor animation, and this does all the animation for all of the, the, the characters. The reason why we have two nodes is because there's one without a flag and one with a flag. Uh, and if I click here, for example, we got animation 11, which was the animation for the waving a flag. That way we can have uh, all of the proper animation playing and everything. So after figuring, figuring that out, uh, we were uh, very pleased with the result. Uh, but as you can see, we have a lot of uh, seats to fill, right? So that type of simulation, at least at the time we add uh, with this version of Typhlo, now it's way smoother. That's the cool thing with Typhlo because he, he updates it uh, a lot. Uh, at that time, it was a bit difficult to spawn all of our characters in. So one really cool workaround that we found is that uh, you can take one part like this and export it as a cache. And then you can instance it where you want them to be copied. So of course you don't instance it right on the side, but for example, that front row right there, we add three variation that we could place all around. So it was a really, really, really fun to, uh, thing to do. Um, of course, there's a whole team that was um, doing the, uh, the camera tracking for the 3D part. It was a huge, uh, a huge step because the camera was uh, in a sequence shot. It was long, and uh, and it it uh, we had a great team that that did that too. A lot of comp artists worked on that too. Um, so yeah, uh, here is a little video of uh, the, that particular 80 seat uh, crowd with the animation and with the waving of flags. Uh, we could have pushed the animation uh, maybe a bit more, but since it was always far away and we had a little bit amount of time, we decided that that was uh, fine for us and the client really liked it. So uh, this is it for the uh, crowd part. And then uh, what else? Oh yeah, uh, one big part because now Typhlo has a uh, sort of uh, get material from the object that you spawn. But when we did that, uh, since we rendered it out with uh, Redshift uh, and it wasn't yet supported, now it is, uh, we needed to assign huge uh, materials to uh, each of the Typhlos. So in that case, uh, to be able to manage all of the, all of the materials for uh, every variation of characters, we had to I'm pretty sure that's a nightmare for a lot of people here. <laughs> a huge spaghetti of uh, of nodes and uh, and material. So this, for example, is the material for the uh, casual people. Uh, you get all your your variation, and this is what we uh, assign to the Typhlo itself. So uh, that was uh, a bit time consuming, but uh, with the uh, little speed up we got with the, the downloaded characters, uh, we managed to uh, to do that. So um, that pretty much uh, sums it up. Um, what else? 
Yeah, so it was a two month um, two month job for the whole project. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I, I think I can uh, maybe cut it short a bit here. Uh, I'm gonna play back the uh, the original so that you can see the final result uh, once again uh, without the sound, of course. And uh, we're really thankful to uh, Pascal Plant, which is the creator of the film Nadia Butterfly, uh, to have chosen us to do the uh, the effects for that. Uh, it was really, really fun to do. And we look forward to working with them maybe in the future. Uh, same goes for you guys that are listening. Uh, Artifacts is continually uh, searching for, uh, for cool projects to work on. Uh, as I said, 3D animation, uh, VFX, all sorts of things. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're really proud. Um, as a small studio, we, we often face uh, challenges that are bigger than our resources. So uh, it, it, what, may, what makes us successful is the, uh, our ability to think outside the box, to adapt quickly and to, uh, to make the most of what we have. In that case, Typhlo was the solution for us. Uh, of course, we could have gone to, uh, with uh, Golem for Maya or there's a, uh, there's a bunch of other uh, plugins that we could have used to do the uh, crowd, but since Typhlo was already uh, integrated in our pipeline, uh, I figured why not uh, use that instead. I saw some couple of examples online. It was a first for me too, but uh, with uh, all of the resources that we can find online, it was, uh, it was achievable. So I would like to thank everybody uh, that listened to that uh, presentation. And here's our contact if you want to uh, contact us in the future. And uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Bruno. All right, thanks, Jeremy. So by the way, there's a lot of love coming your way on the YouTube live chat. Cool. You should definitely go have a look. Uh, do you Perfect. know if the uh, Nadia Butterfly is available on any online platform? Can we watch it or? It's not out yet, but okay. uh, it's gonna be soon. soon okay, soon. at some point. All right, let's go right away to our next speaker. So now next we have Laurent Abekassis is the president and founder of K6 Media Group. Laurent is based in Montreal and is also the president of the 3DS Max Montreal user group. He has over 25 years of experience in game VFX film. And a fun fact, Laurent has been friend with Vlado for more than 20 years. I don't know if that's true. So it's like D Vlado who created V-Ray. Is that true, Laurent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Impressive. If you go even further on the fun fact, uh, I remember at SIGGRAPH 2001 uh, in Los Angeles, um, one evening where I was with Vlado and a few other people, and that was the evening that was before the day uh, of the first, very first presentation of V-Ray that would be presented to Blizzard at the time, and I was there, and to um, Digital Dimension at the time. And then that evening, Vlado renamed that executable to V-Ray Ray Tracer. Wow. In 2001? 2001. I was in high school, I think. <laughs> All right, take it away, Laura. Thanks. Thanks. So, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm very happy to be here. Um, today, I will be talking briefly about uh, a production that we've done uh, in Montreal at my studio, K6 Media Group, and some of the project and some of the plugins and tool set that we use. And I will also be talking a bit about uh, the different approach that we we use when, when facing issue with the softwares and how to overcome those. Um, so before getting started, uh, I have a little video that will be an intro of the show I will be talking. So it's a little teaser. So thank you for playing the teaser and then I'll be continuing it. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, I'm not the one managing it. So it's supposed to be taken care of by, yep, thank you. It's coming, coming, coming. So that show was all made in Max. And here we go. It's a Christmas snowflake. A surprise visitor comes to Holiday Hill. Oh, great. First a square pumpkin, and now a green cat. Your name is Nestletoe. It's written right there on your collar. So we can help you find your way home. Hey, come back here. We need to go after him. This is an emergency. Join the adventure. Ah. Come on, follow me. Kittens? Hello. Feel the magic. This is gonna be the best Christmas ever. And find your way home. Mine is out there somewhere. A Disney Junior Family Night special event. Spookly Returns in Spookly and the Christmas Kittens. Premieres Friday night, December 6th at 7 on Disney Junior. I caught a snow... I caught a snowflake. Visitor comes... 
Thanks. Um, so yeah, um, so we produced this show last year. Um, I will <coughs> share my screen, go into a quick uh, and short presentation briefly uh, right now. Um, here we go. So, so the, the, we, we started the production uh, in January 2019 and the show was uh, developed by uh, numerous companies. It was uh, developed um, based on a book from Holiday Hill Farm and then it was made to be first window of broadcast in the US last year for Christmas on Disney Channel and Disney Junior. It will be this year uh, for holiday season. Uh, it will be available this year um, on Netflix worldwide. It was produced and directed by Oddvius in Montreal and K6 Media Group as well. And Diomatic um, developed uh, the, the, the animation pipeline. Uh, we use V-Ray also for the rendering and then other studios like Exodor, Demente in Mexico, also at the South and Guadalajara. Um, we, so yeah, it was a 45 minutes full CG show. We had uh, 11 months to produce it. We had about 35 people working on it full time. Uh, and there was a total of about uh, 665 shots uh, to produce 25 characters in total, uh, including furry characters, numerous furry characters walking in snow, um, lots of challenges for CG. Um, we decided to use 3ds Max. That's our ultimate weapon of choice for most of our productions. So we had Max uh, with shotgun and back burner from Autodesk. <clears throat> and uh, from Adobe, we use uh, now Substance, Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere. And then we use plenty of plugins, uh, Smart Ref, Instant Rig, Morphomatic, V-Ray, Airform, 4D Hair. Uh, now what I will do is uh, I will play a few videos uh, sharing a few steps of how we did a few things. Um, so we, we use Shotgun for the management of all the product and uh, all the management of all the shots that we do internally. Uh, whether it's a, it's a shot, it's an animation, um, whether it's an animation for TV videos or whatever visual effects, we use Shotgun for everything. And we, we, we customize the, the process for every step of the way of every single department, um, every task, everything that has to be done by each steps. And we call a step every time we save a scene or it goes to a different artist and stuff like that. So we would manage different shots um, directly inside a, a, of Shotgun assign the task, and then it get distributed. Uh, but once it get distributed, uh, inside of 3ds Max, we replace the, the file manager uh, to our very own file manager um, that, that reads the database directly inside of Shotgun. Uh, and so rather than having artists browse files and having to figure out where are the files located and which one is the latest version, you, you can directly browse with this a uh, little widget that we put in MaxScript and Python. Um, you, you can read directly from Shotgun, which shot should I want to open? So let's grab a shot. And then which steps, which are the various animation stage, which are all the tasks that are connected to Shotgun. And so we can open up directly the shot without really caring about where it's located. We can still read all the versioning and all the files that are saved on disk. And then we don't really care about where is it located. Uh, and uh, we, we, we just open the files. Click open and voila, it will open the right version for the artist. Voila. So very easy, saving a lot of time to, to browse files and everything. Um, we have, so another fun fact, uh, one of the very first uh, plugin that Vlado developed uh, was SimCloth. Uh, it was a Mac script. So back in the days, um, Vlado, around the time of Max 2, uh, 98, 99 time frame. Uh, Vlado developed uh, one of the first uh, CLOT simulator uh, for 3ds Max, and it was called SimCLOT. And at that time, uh, I, I became friend uh, with, with him over the internet, me based in Montreal and Vlado based in Sofia. Uh, and so what, with my company at the time that was just getting started, uh, Vlado actually developed the very first version uh, of Morphomatic, uh, which is our morphing plugin that we are still uh, using today. So here we can see the morphing tools. Um, that is really, uh, wait a sec, I'm seeing an issue with my share. There we go. Um, should be fine now, should be back, yeah. 
So you can see here the the more traumatic engine uh, inside of uh, GDS Max. So it replaced Morphers and add about 100 features to Morpher. And that's, and that's really the thing is that everyone who used 3ds Max in production, I know it, I doesn't I don't know anybody who used 3ds Max without any tools, without any scripts, without any customization. And, and so I want to talk briefly about this because in this production we use 3ds Max, but we didn't use the scanline renderer, we use Vray, we didn't use Morpher, we use Morphomatic, we didn't use Xref, we use Smartref. So a lot of things we, we were like, yeah, that doesn't do quite what we want. And so that's the approach that we take is once we reach a limit or something, we, we would develop our own solutions. Uh, sometimes with the help of Autodesk, uh, I invite everybody to communicate with Autodesk whenever you, you, you encounter an issue, to communicate with them through beta channels and to also register if you do develop plugins to uh, the ADN Autodesk Developer Network. So you can get access to debug version. So here's another example. And this time, so we had a tool to open up and pull files from Shotgun. Here's the opposite. When we save a file, we don't save it with a save dialog. We save it with a custom dialog where we point cache all the data at the same time uh, and create a preview, push it to Shotgun and mark the task as the next step it has to be made. A little screenshot to goes along, boop, publish, and then it will do its thing. Uh, around right now, we're still publishing live. Among the things we're currently working on into the pipeline is to automate the publishing so it doesn't use the current session of 3ds Max, but it just does it in the back one and you can continue to work. But still, the, the publish on very heavy scene, 20 characters and a lot of things uh, could take a lot of time. Um, as you can see here in the screenshots, uh, Sponsored by Twin Preso. Um, here um, we use hair uh, in this particular production. Uh, so when we we first tried with the Max hair tool, uh, we could do a, a very nice hair for one frame. And then we hit the limit whenever we wanted to animate, to manage multiple characters in a shot. So we, we look at various solutions and we, we decided to go with hair form. Hair form is very well integrated with, with V-Ray. Um, and our farm is using uh, different techniques and, and the, the way the representation, because we have a lot of, it's the total opposite of photo reel. We're doing singing cats that are pink and blue, right? So while we are going with the photo reel rendering style with uh, V-Rave in terms of having the object being feel touchable, you know, palpable, um, most of the stuff is, is not really accurate, you know, uh, singing cats, talking pumpkins. Uh, that's also something that we don't see a lot in the real world. So we, we had to come up with many things. So we, we liked a lot hair farm because of the way we had artistic controls over the feathering and the fur and how we could blend multiple fur uh, groups together. Uh, another thing that we, once we had the hair and everything uh, lined up for the rendering, and another thing that was important for us was the control of the day. Because in the whole show, which lasts 45 minutes, the, the whole show is actually 24 hours in a day and it starts in the very early morning and it ends at night, very late at night. So we, we develop our very own uh, sky lighting system um, based on textures and multi-layers. That would light all the scenes uh, inside of V-Ray because we didn't want it to be accurate or to use locations of suns or to use real gradients and stuff. We had to get artistic control where in a specific shot, the director wanted the moon to be here and to have a cloud there and, and, and that type of controls. Um, so we, we built this type of rig um, inside of uh, Max. Uh, we produced this with Max 2019. Most of it was produced all of it based in Montreal. But what you, for us, what was important was to be in communication with the people. So most of us, we know very well Vlado from the community. Vlado has always been very active. We had issue with hair and Vlado got into an email in a minute we, we get a reply. But what I want to say is that this is not just only Vlado, it's Vire, we're talking about Chaos Group, but, but a lot of people are very similar into the community. When you run into, when you're entering into issues with rendering pipelines uh, inside of 3ds Max, like OSL shaders, Zap is always somebody you can count on uh, if you have questions and stuff like that. So really, um, that, that's, the, the, the community is present, but you get a reach for them. And one thing I want to add before going to my final clip that will be a happy song to conclude my presentation, um, 
I just want to say something I hear a lot on the channels and on stacks and on the place on Facebook, on CG, uh, press, and all these other sites that Autodesk doesn't think this, Autodesk doesn't agree with that. There is no such thing as Autodesk. Autodesk is no one. Uh, Autodesk is not somebody. There are plenty of people who work for Autodesk, and they're pretty cool if you contact them. But if you make yourself that Autodesk is like this bad monster, it, it might be this bad monster to you, and then you will just never be happy. But if you reach out and you share your project, as you can see that we are all doing from all over the world, just here in Montreal tonight and stuff like that, they're there. They're, they're human beings. They're very cool. They're passionate about the software. So reach out and, and stop complaining because when you reach out, it's a whole different world. But if you keep complaining, meh, then you get into a, ah, I don't like it. Blender is so cool. I should go to Houdini and all this type of stuff. That's okay. But you got to pick your battle. At my studio, the approach that we, we took is really to go further. When, when, how to, to get what we want and how to achieve it, you know? So reach out to everybody. Everybody's active on the community. Thank you all. And here is my happy song from Spooky. Happy holiday season. It's coming soon. Our story continues on a farm that's unique where melons can sing and pumpkins can speak, where wishes are granted and dreams come true. It's a world full of wonder, just waiting for you. The adventure's begun. Come join the fun, because every day is a holiday on Holiday Hill Farm. Huh? <laughs> oh! <laughs> look, Jack, look! I caught a snowflake! That's not just any snowflake, Spookly. That's a Christmas snowflake. Those are the very best ones. Look, everybody! Huh? Look what I caught! Oh. Spookly! Oh. It's Christmas snow! <laughs> it's snow, it's snow, it's Christmas snow. Go tell everyone you know. Old and young, tell everyone. This is Christmas snow. It's not like any other snow. It falls but once a year. It brings goodwill and joy to all and heaps of holiday cheer. It's snow, it's snow, it's Christmas snow. A very merry ho, ho, ho. Come everyone, join in the fun. This is Christmas snow. Slide down a hill and take a spill. Build snowmen as big as you please. Make wings on the ground, cause there's magic around. That drifts right up to your knees. It's soft and white, clean and bright. It changes everything in sight. That sound you hear is holiday cheer. It's starting to sight, you're starting to sight. Watching. I give it to our next presenter, Samia, who's with us. So thank you all. Hello. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. I'm really looking forward. I love Halloween and I love Christmas. So this is the perfect combo. <laughs> so before we head on to Samia, I got, guys, I have to say, um, if any of you guys are tired out there, you don't have a right to be because Samia is joining us from 4 a.m. in Qatar time. So that's how dedicated she is, um, you know, to kind of make this event happen. So, um, so Samiha also has been featured in a few of our Autodesk area community page articles. Um, and, you know, we love her beautiful work and she has such great expression into detail into her interior designs. Um, so we're glad that she's joining us at 4 a.m. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, her, her love is in her imagination and, you know, translating that imagination to fantasy stories and presenting those stories through 3D images. So 
This is our favorite part of the 3D journey and we're looking forward to having you present. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So uh, here I am again. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, thank you so much for this great opportunity and uh, uh, to speak in this great event. So uh, thank you, uh, Kausi Group. Thank you, Autodesk, and especially uh, Nancy. So um, let's say again, I'm Samiha from Tunisia. I learned interior design in the School of Fine Art in Tunisia. And I uh, did a training for a 3G in the School of uh, Art and Technology in Nebel, Netanfu, Tunisia. Um, what I have learned in the School of 3G, it's a bit different from uh, of what I do now. Actually, I uh, learned um, uh, character design, environment, uh, production of film, animation, and something like that. And just after graduation, I back to interior designs like return to basics. <laughs> so um, the, last, uh, the last eight years, uh, I joined uh, different companies in, some, in a few different uh, countries. Um, and now I'm, uh, I'm a freelancer. I work as a freelance, uh, freelancer in uh, 3G um, visualization industry. So uh, tonight I will show you uh, some of my work and um, I will present uh, a a uh, making of uh, of uh, one uh, of my favorite uh, work, personal work. So uh, let's start by sharing my uh, screen. Uh, just tell me when it's done. Um, is it sharing here? Yes. Okay, good. So let's start by interior design renders. Uh, here are some renders made for a client. Uh, some of them are made for um, the company for designers consultancy here in Qatar. Um, let me um, let me admit that working as a 3G visualizer and interior designer at the same time is a real challenge. So um, I try always to make a balance between my different tasks uh, of work, uh, like a coordination with clients, contacting suppliers, um, controlling shop drawings, going to the site to do the follow-up. And with that, I have to deal um, with a suitable uh, 3G renders for my, uh, for my interior uh, design concept. So uh, this is not easy at all regarding the time management. Um, so that's it. This is my, let's say this is my official work. Let's move now to, um, to my favorite part, let's say, in my 3D journey. And let's talk a bit about my personal work renders. So um, as you can see here, uh, a few renders made um, last seven years. I uh, aim to do one uh, personal work every year. Um, because it's like a self-development. Um, it pushed me to learn more, to discover more, uh, to improve my skills, to, to develop my knowledge and make it up to date to the new features. And also it's a big pleasure, especially when uh, I participate with this uh, in some challenges in 3G communities. I, I like this. Unfortunately, I didn't work on a new uh, personal uh, work since two years, but I will back <laughs> to this soon. Uh, so I have a point here. I focus on it a lot. It's the content. For me, the content uh, is more important uh, than everything. We have to take care of the content before talking about software, because in my opinion, uh, software is, um, is a tool, is, is a technique of representation like drawing, fine thing or skill thing. It's more than that for sure. Um, but the question is uh, what we're gonna present with this tool? If we don't have um, a, a good story behind this, if we don't have a message, a good structured image, uh, harmonious uh, color palette, we cannot, um, we cannot reach or achieve um, an attractive or a unique image. So this is what I focus on when I work on personal project. Whatever I succeed of this or not, but I try always to make, uh, to keep my own signature, to keep my own style and uh, try to give a feeling um, or soul to my image through uh, storytelling. So um, let's jump now to, uh, 
uh, to talk a bit about uh, the process of uh, making uh, this uh, this work. And um, so uh, just I will show you, um, yeah, I will show you this project. This is the making of, or this project is titled, titled uh, The Corridor in Pursuit of Beauty. Um, I did this uh, render uh, a few years ago and I wrote with it a story. And uh, it's a kind of speech between a group of women uh, living on the sky, on the cloud, on a castle with a cat. And this cat, one day it becomes a tyrant. So um, I cannot go deeply into the, the story because time doesn't allow me that, but it's, uh, uh, it's available in Arabic and in English for, uh, for who, who want to read it. So uh, let's go step by step into this uh, into this project. And the first step, uh, what I do uh, or what I think about is the team and uh, research. So first of all, I think about uh, the framing. I work generally on a portrait camera because I compose better on this. And then I do a quick sketch, really quick, just to preserve my idea, to fix the camera, and also to draw uh, the big lines. Let, let's say it's like, uh, it's like tracing the big zones of, of, my, of my environment. Um, and then I go to, uh, to search for the mood, uh, the color palette, uh, how is the fog, how is the light, the, the effects, um, which kind of light I will use, is it, uh, is it sunlight or is it daylight, is it night uh, mood or uh, yeah, like this. So uh, also I think about if it's, uh, it's cold or warm, something like this, 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 uh, these details. And according to this, I go to sell, to collect some uh, some reference photo. Um, I'm really amazed by this style: uh, damaged, <laughs> abandoned places, the vintage, the antique, the ancient style. Um, I really love it. Uh, it contains a lot of details. It's uh, charming and give a good result uh, in in 3D renders. So uh, I prefer always working on this style. Uh, even if you note, all, all, my, all my renders look similar. It's like from the same area, but it's a different project. So um, after this step, I go to think about composition. Composition. Um, so before, before, before starting with Max, I think about it this, what I will use as grid, uh, what I have in foreground and background, um, how I will uh, compose my, um, my object, uh, how I will do the direction to read the image, uh, which is the grid to work with. So in this project, I learned a bit about the dynamic symmetry. Since I um, will create a corridor um, uh, with arches, so uh, I wanted to be uh, symmetrical in a way, but not 100%. It's like symmetrical, but dynamic at the same time. Um, so here is some reference from the dynamic uh, symmetry. And then now we're going to go to uh, the first step in the software. Let's open Max and go step by step to see uh, what I do for this. I start. Uh, First thing, I start uh, to tap Alt B to merge the grid, the picture of the grid that I will use. Actually, I don't use this method in another uh, another type of uh, composition, like uh, the grid of third or uh, Fibonacci. This is I do it visually. But since I just discovered this uh, this dynamic symmetry, I wanted to create something accurate. So what I do is I, I put the grid in the background and I start composing with it. I just put boxes like this. It's not clean modeling, just to fix uh, the floor, the wall, the ceiling, and try to, to, um, to make the modeling matches with, with the lines of grid. Here, as you see, it's, it's not clean at all. <laughs> so, what I, what I did here, I merged um, any woman, 
uh, I find it in my library. Just I will I will change it after, but I just wanted to compose with a woman. I put the clothes quickly and uh, started uh, put it in the scene and uh, wanted to merge it uh, as per the grid and uh, to see in which position I would put in the building. So um, this is how I compose the big elements uh, in the first step. And then I go to freeze everything and I remodel uh, again. I do a clean modeling in the right way. So uh, this is the first step in, uh, in Max. And then I jump to light and fog. So with the lights, I, I work on the light even before merging the furniture and accessories. I want to work the light on an empty scene. So here, as you see, I merged, uh, not I merged, I, I created uh, different sunlight with uh, different colors and different value to see how it affects my scene. Um, it's like painting. I'm here. I'm like painting. It's, 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 this is different from the work of clients because here I'm like putting some orange here, some blue there to see how I create harmony uh, with uh, with the, the with the colors of uh, Viray Sun. So um, this is an example of uh, the colors how it's uh, distributed here. And if you note here, I don't have uh, too many light sources. I just use sunlight and dome uh, and some accent, uh, some additional light for, for the character in foreground, let's say accent, accent light. And uh, based to this, I go to, um, to work on fog, the environment, uh, very environment fog. So uh, when I work on fog, I, I go to global switch and I change the color to black. I want to to see the fog on a black uh, modeling. So um, after that, I go to the parameters of the fog and uh, change the values um, of the fog color and the fog emission to two contrasted uh, colors, like for example, red and uh, gray, uh, red and green, to see how it affects to my scene and how it's how is the distribution of each color in every color in every corner from the scene, um, how, is the, how is the level? And I start to play with the values and box gizmo until I get what I want. Since I, uh, everything is okay, I change this color to, for example, dark blue and uh, um, pastel orange, and I render. So um, this is uh, this is how I do the fog. And before I go to the next step, let me clarify something. Um, I really don't use complex uh, methods in um, technically. Um, 3GS Max and Vray are unlimited softwares. Uh, we cannot use every parameter or every command. So what I do is to get the necessary and work with it. I I don't go deeply to techniques really. So just with simple stuff, I, uh, I try to work with it. And another point also, I love creating everything in Max. I don't use Photoshop Lab actually. So um, I want to get maybe, let's say 80% from the work in Max and Vray. Really. Even the DOP, the motion blur, the V-ray light fog, the glow, everything, I do it in Max and V-ray. If you see here, here is the raw image and here is the after a post-production image. Really, there is no big difference. Um, I, I don't see big difference. So maybe this, this is not the right way to work, but I feel comfortable with that and I love this. Uh, by the way, I'm really happy about the new feature of V-Ray 5 to do, um, that allow you to do the compositing of uh, element render in, uh, in the V-Ray frame buffer. Uh, I feel like it may, it's made for me. So uh, yeah, it's, it's very good. This is, this is how I want to work. I, I want to get the maximum from in the raw image uh, and that's it. So, um, now we have our light and fog fixed. 
and we're gonna jump to uh, let's say uh, details and effects. Okay, so here in this step, I'm gonna uh, merge the furniture and the accessories in uh, the scene. So um, in this case also, in this phase also, I, uh, I merge again this grid and I, I start composing the objects uh, align it to this uh, to this grid. Uh, here, I didn't forget any corner without details. Like the um, you see here, for example, the painting. Uh, this uh, this bird in front. It's very far, but um, it it's not merged randomly. Every piece in this uh, in this um, scene is put it by calculation. I added women everywhere because this is a scene of women. There's too much women if you if you see if you see the render so um, I, I I try always to make the the object make an intersection in a way to avoid the tangent uh, I have too many details here like wire uh, electrical boxes uh, paper uh, too much too much details I can I can uh, make another renders in in the scene um, so. We back also um, to talk about mapping here. Uh, there's the website uh, CG Texture. Uh, it helps me a lot on this kind of, uh, of work because it contains a lot of old texture. So I pick I pick some uh, old and the magic the magic textures and I push to this by. Um, by using the blend uh, material uh, to make it look like broken and all and something like this. So we're back here to some elements uh, in the scene. Uh, I have like um, curtain and uh, door and fan and bird and some papers that I made an animation for this. I didn't do a big thing in animation in animation really. Even even the bird normally I rig it and skin and I, I, I do the animation for further, but I said let's do simple uh, stuff. So uh, I animate this object for uh, to, to, to do the motion blur effect. And uh, here also I did the depth of field for uh, for the, the woman in, in the foreground. And uh, here is the scene is ready. Uh, so we are here in the last uh, step um, in, 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 this, uh, in this project. So here I have uh, the character and the rendering. So I will um, merge the final character. So I changed the old character, I composed it, and I change it to one new, and it must be rigged and skinned that it allow me to, um, to move its part, like uh, her fingers, to uh, to take her veil, uh, her hand, the, the head, the eyes. So I wanted to move it as I want to match with my uh, angle of view. Here is the veil of this character, the clothes. So I once once the position of the woman is fixed, I export it FBX and import it to uh, Marvelous Design. Um, uh, software. It's really amazing for cloth uh, creation. So I create this veil um, and insert it to uh, Max again and push it in some details in Max like textures. Uh, also here, for example, this is a small details. I, I just did the loop selection on the border and make it a bit round. I did it with uh, another kind of material, leather for, for the reflection. It's a small detail, but we can see it in the render here if you if you notice. See, this kind of details make uh, make the make changes in the, in the render. So uh, here we are almost done. Um, the final step, I just add some element uh, renders. I don't use a lot really, just the basic reflection, refraction, AO, and some two others that could help in Photoshop. And I put the, um, the K-frame in the right position to get my uh, motion blur effect, as you see here, and render go, here we are. So, um, 
it was Greek uh, making of, <laughs> like Brennan. <laughs> so yeah, this is the work. I love this kind of uh, of work uh, that contains too much details. I enjoy a lot. You know, personal work is is really a pleasure because uh, because you work uh, without time. You do whatever you want. Uh, you learn and everything. Uh, so I'm sorry. I just cut the video. And I start in. Yeah, I'm back here. <laughs> so yeah, this is that's why I love the personal work because, as I said, it 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 it, uh, it allow you to unleash your imagination, to create the stories, to do whatever you want, and um, you learn a lot about this. I will back soon to this, hopefully. So thank you so much for watching, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Amia. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Oh, that was amazing. So proud of you, girl. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Oh, <laughs> it was quick. <laughs> I know. And guys, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm saying like there's a lot of passion here. So we're a little behind schedule. But we have time for Jeff and Antoine. Yeah. So no stress. We have a bit of time. So I'm going to introduce Jeff. Um, Jeff Model is the founder and CEO of CGArchitect.com. So as you guys know, it's a very influential, the most influential online magazine for archivists and design professionals in our community. So he's coming to us from Calgary and um, you guys know that he's a pillar in the community and he's actually won a, uh, he's been awarded a lifetime achievement award by the American Society for Architectural Illustrators. So he's got a few words under his belt um, and he probably doesn't want me to say this but I know this about him is that he has a deep passion for running ducks <laughs> <laughs> yeah I knew you yeah, I knew you couldn't hold it back you had to you had to bring it up yeah so, and yeah, for his the, boy fish. Lockdown, like, yeah, there's something about me. fish too right? <laughs> that's right yeah so, <laughs> yeah so, so, sorry Jeff but that's, that's, I lost my uh I lost it, your passion <laughs> Awesome. Over to you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Let me share full screen. So just let me know if you can see that. Are you guys seeing that? Okay. Yeah, all good. All right. So uh, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty quick here. So Early last year, I started doing a ton of research into AI to solve a problem that we had on CG Architect. And, you know, I spent about a, several hundred hours testing and, and doing experiments and whatnot. And, and in this research, I stumbled upon this field called neuroaesthetics, which led me down all sorts of different rabbit holes of experimental psychology and art history and neuroscience and AI and machine learning. So it was quite an interesting path. Uh, I presented an hour long talk, but right before lockdown in London. So tonight's kind of like a really super fast 10 minute uh, speed session on this. So my goal in all of this research was to try to find some sort of an empirical basis for why we find things uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, and to find out if the rules of composition and contrast and balance, et cetera, came about uh, to see if there was something, if they were based on something universal that we could leverage in the creation of uh, ArcViz. And the point of my research and the longer talk that I did wasn't to suggest that subjective judgment was not important or that there were not many factors that affect aesthetic judgment, but maybe to find if there was some empirical knowledge that would help guide those subjective judgments and if maybe there was new tools that we could build based upon that data. So on the new version of CG Architect that we launched a couple months ago, there was a very specific problem that we had that ties in quite closely to AI and this research that I was doing on neuroaesthetics. So the goal of CG Architects has always really been to be a platform for the industry for artists to uh, show off what they're doing. And I, I've always taken a fairly democratic approach to this, you know, whether you are a seasoned uh, veteran or somebody new to the industry, I wanted everybody to have an equal chance of getting exposure on the homepage. Um, this sounds really good in theory, but in practice, it actually doesn't work very well. You know, one minute you'll come to the homepage and you'll see some amazing images, and then maybe five minutes later, some not so amazing images. And you know, when we don't see amazing images, people don't feel compelled to dig deeper into the site. And then all of a sudden people don't get the exposure that they want. And this also means as all of this work is submitted, the good work gets pushed down and we, we, there's a less likelihood of the good work being seen. So really the only way for us to know what is good or bad is to either manually curate every single piece of content that comes onto the site, which is thousands of pieces every month, which doesn't scale very well. Or we wait for people to like, comment, and view uh, on the images so we get social feedback and we can rank the images accordingly. 
But the problem is if the good work is pushed down too quickly, we never really, uh, it still never gets seen and we're kind of not accomplishing our goal. So as it relates to this talk, it brings up this interesting discussion of if there's something universal about imagery and what we find aesthetically pleasing uh, and if it can be empirically explained. So this problem on CG Architect is trying to find a way to automate determining if an image is good or bad before we get these social cues. Uh, more specifically, we want to determine if an image should be kind of pushed up the ladder, not necessarily to assign a score to say that this is the best image. Um, what we came up with was this algorithm that uses about 40 different metrics to assess uh, what likely makes an image good, including this AI that we've trained to recognize what our industry considers to be aesthetically pleasing work. And our approach takes both human subjective evaluations and combines it with this machine learning algorithm to get the best result. Um, what we did is we took our database of nearly 100,000 ArcVis images uh, and with the knowledge of what we know the industry considers to be good, both from the social feedback we had received you know, over the years uh, and through awards and whatnot. And then we trained this AI to create this gradient score. And then uh, we are able to display in certain filters on the site based on that. So you can see here uh, some selections that the AI made last week. This is just a random selection about a week ago. And uh, it doesn't get it right every time. Sometimes we get false positives, but I would say on average, we hit about 70 to 80% accuracy in, in what we're uh, trying to do. So for what we're trying to do, it works really well. So we've also implemented this AI to do visual search. Uh, anytime you click on an image on CG Architect, you can click the similar search button. And within a few seconds, it searches through hundreds of thousands of images or 100,000 images uh, in our archive to find the one that clo most closely matches. And we're not doing this based on keywords, but visual similarity at a very low level. And it's actually kind of a cool feature because you can really uh, uncover a lot of amazing work that you may not have seen in the past. Uh, we've also implemented a tool where you can upload your own images, whether that be a photograph or another rendering, so that you can also search this way. Um, we've used an AI to extract the most salient colors in images so that you can search by color. And this one, I think, is the biggest time saver. Uh, we used to ask everybody to tag their images when they uploaded to CG Architect, but we know it's kind of a tedious task. So we have three different AIs that use computer vision analysis on every rendering that's uploaded, and all of these contextual tags get added to our images uh, automatically. So visualization lives in this really interesting middle ground between commercial art and fine art. Uh, and as a result, I think we're able to analyze visualization from a more formalist approach. This visualization tends to focus more on illustrative and technical depictions. Um, I think it's a bit easier to try to find universality in aesthetic features and visualization because there's so much relative similarity uh, in how work is presented in our industry versus say, the expanse of fine art that maybe encompasses everything from Renaissance realism all the way to modern contemporary art. And what I was most interested in is seeking if there is universality in what we consider to be pleasing, not so much what we uh, specific, find specifically beautiful. And it's worth considering when we have a group of judges evaluate uh, images and we look to rank images on social media through measures of likes or a score, it doesn't signal universal beauty that's shared by everyone, but rather this average consensus about what we find appealing. You know, I think if we can obtain an, this average consensus through an AI mechanism, then perhaps there is universality a little bit in uh, the images that we create. There's dozens of examples of this in research. Um, unfortunately, I can't show them all tonight, but I'm just going to show you a synopsis of one piece of research that was done a couple years ago. So in 2014, Dr. Giuseppe Galletta presented his findings uh, on an experiment on Facebook that he ran. Uh, and every day for three years, he posted images from contemporary artworks to two different Facebook profiles, separated by untrained and trained art experts. And over three years, he posted 15,000 images. And then he analyzed the likes and shares to see if he could correlate, uh, or find a correlation between the specific characteristics in those images and what people liked and commented upon and shared. And his results actually suggested that aesthetic preference uh, maybe not in, be entirely subjective, but based on this quote unquote specific neural matrix of aesthetic pleasure, meaning the way that our bond, our, our brain rather biologically uh, responds. So in this experiment, he found that there was no significant difference between nationality or expertise in what was liked and shared most often. Um, and when he got all of the results in order to test the theory, uh, they collected a bunch of images that contained the criteria that they felt would garner the greatest response and they were able to successfully predict the outcomes of uh, what was liked and shared. So while we use a slightly different approach of an aesthetic, uh, in our aesthetic prediction engine on CG Architect, um, the underlying concept is the same. And in many of these experiments, uh, these dozens of experiments, often they were able to achieve anywhere from 70 to 85% accuracy in their predictions. 
So another method for analyzing how we view images uh, and what we find aesthetically pleasing is through the use of eye tracking. Um, eye tracking art goes back as far as the 1930s. Um, and even back then they were able to observe that no two people viewed the image exactly the same way, but they did find some global patterns. For example, they found that participants tended to focus uh, on high contrast regions of the foreground, including faces and people. More recent research has shown that there are two different, it's a two stage model of when viewers are looking at representational or abstract art, where they spend the first few seconds doing this global sweep of the image and then they concentrate on the finer details. They also found that the eye movement patterns change dramatically depending on the viewing instructions. And the same eye tracker research actually showed that natural images like landscapes, uh, the eyes tend to spend more time in regions that contain more informational content. These regions often corresponded to features like uh, curves, corners, and occlusions. Um, it changes in intensity like straight lines and edges also drew uh, biological responses as well. In fact, natural images, when they would do a lot of this research, tended to be found to be the most universally pleasing images. So I'm not sure if this is maybe scientific proof for why our industry is so fascinated with these cabin in the wood renderings. So in another study, uh, participants looked at original figurative and abstract paintings from Molina, Mondrian, Rembrandt, and Della Francesca. And then they looked at modified versions of those same paintings to see how, the, how it impacted the salient regions of the painting and where the eyes would trace through the images. So Mondrian was well known for his mastery and balance and harmony as paintings created by horizontal and vertical lines and his use of primary colors. And in this experiment here, uh, the balance was thrown off by swapping the red and blue squares in the top right and bottom left squares. And the eye tracking data showed in the original, uh, the exploration seemed to be quite balanced across the image. But when they swapped the squares, the eye was almost trapped in the blue square. And in this painting by Della Francesca, researchers moved the dove uh, right here, immediately above Christ's head uh, to the right side of the image. And in doing so, they broke up this vertical symmetry that was being reinforced in the image. In the original eye tracking, you can see that there's this vertical line of, of the eye being traced up and down the middle of, in, of this image, uh, showcasing the importance of this axis. But when the dove was moved over to the right-hand side, uh, the eye tracking seems to be quite erratic and, and just jumps from face to face in the image. So the overall experiment shows the significance of both the subtle and not so subtle compositional elements in the scene and how it can affect the way we navigate a scene. Uh, and I bring this research up as a point of how important composition is in our work and how much it can not only affect where we look, but how we respond to that work. So this was a super fast speed session. Normally this talks about a little bit over an hour. So I hope you guys have enjoyed that. I'm going to be recording my hour long talk uh, probably in the next month or so, and I'll post that up on CG Architect. And as a quick reminder, we've got just a couple of days left or a couple of weeks left rather for the 2020 CG Architect 3D Awards. Deadline is September 22nd, so be sure to head over there and submit. And this is the biggest uh, awards event of our, our year. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. That was super interesting. Thank you so much. So I need to rush and announce the winner for the raffle. Do we have the names that we can post? So there's one lucky winner who's winning one year license for Vireo Corona, 3ds Max, Sinai software, and a free ticket for the creative lighting light mix class. And the lucky winner is Marwa Karim from the US. So congratulations. And there's one lucky winner who won a bunch of Chaos Group swag. So lucky you, I'm Jelly. And his name is Kurt Mar Masteler. Uh, so congratulations. All right. Lucky you. All right, over to you, Nancy. Okay, guys, so we apparently have gone over time and we had one more presenter, Antoine, and um, we literally have four minutes left. And Antoine, we owe you a huge apology and we will be happy to host you on the next 3DS Max webinar, which you'll have a full 20 minutes to present. Um, if there's anything you'd like to say in the next, you know, like four minutes, please do. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, this is the nature of live events. You know, we tried to keep everything on schedule and I really, really apologize. No, no, it's okay, guys. It was a really nice evening uh, to see all of you presenting nice, nice things. So personally, uh, I'm working in the gaming industry for 20 years. I'm running an art studio dedicated to 
uh, to vehicle and uh, building modeling. So be there next time and I will explain and show you what my team is doing. Thank you. He'll be back. He'll be back. And again, sorry, Jeff, to cut it short. And sorry, Antoine, like, <laughs> I really apologize. We thought we had a set schedule. Um, but I, I mean, I really appreciate all of you being here. And um, on behalf of everybody here, everybody at Autodesk, we hope that everybody's family is staying safe and healthy. We know everybody's going through really tough times right now. So Make sure you reach out to your community and reach out to us if there's anything that we can do to help. And I think from this point, we have to hand it over to our LA folks. 